following is a text exchange which occurred between brothers on July 3rd, 2021. 4.15 p.m. About to watch the England vs. Ukraine match. Curious about the anthem lyrics. Ukraine is not yet dead, nor its glory and freedom. Luck will still smile on us, brother Ukrainians. Our enemies will die, as the dew does in the sunshine. And we, too, brothers, will live happy in our land. We'll not spare either our souls or our bodies to get freedom. Heartwarming stuff. Very manly. It says their enemies will evaporate. Straight from the heartland, this is Things I Text My Brother. Hey folks, and welcome back to another episode of Things I Text My Brother, a series of conversations which have taken place between the Brothers Drew Yard on subjects spanning the neighborhood and the globe, which will hopefully leave you smarter, kinder, and better looking. Today we're going to jump off from that dramatic reading that you just heard and discuss the topics therein. Maybe we'll talk about Ricky Martin. Maybe we'll talk about burning hearts and burning orphan tears. Maybe we'll talk about evaporation, guns and roses, or paths built over bodies but we haven't plotted an exact course yet because we want you to join us on that journey. That's how it works on Things I Text My Brother. I'm Jeff. This is Brad. Let's talk about our texts. But before we dive into the Ukrainian waters mentioned a few moments ago, we need to take a look back because it's always important to make time to cleanse ourselves of our past sins and to continue our boundless quest for self-improvement through worthless information. Thus, it's time for ablutions and edification. This time, Brother Brad, you're starting us off with an ablution. What do you have? I'm going to start us off with an ablution. We both are going to get our knuckles wrapped on this one because we both messed it up. Whoops. In episode 12, the really big charter in Skewtage, Mm -hmm. you correctly stated that the $300 Honest Abe paid for a placement soldier in the Civil War was worth around $5,000 in today's currency. Okay. However, later in the episode, we both misstated that it was worth $3,000. So we got our numbers wrong later, and I think it's because we got ourselves confused with the $3,000 in specie that the Confederates were to pay to have a replacement soldier. It's all very tricky. Yeah. We both got it wrong, so I'm betting some of our eagle-eared, eagle-eared, bat-eared? What do you you call it? Eagle-eyed, but what do you call it for ears? Do birds have ears? (laughs) I'm assuming birds have ears, yes. Okay. But uh, so we, uh, we, we both screwed that up. Well, we've both been cleansed of that one. So now it's time to move on to a little bit of edification. I want to go back to our previous episode about Soapy Smith, episode 14. Within that episode, you told the story about collecting some money out of a styrofoam cup at work. And I got lost thinking about kitchenette. You had collected the money in a kitchenette, and all I could think about is a person deciding to start a store called Kitchenette. Well, sure enough, that store already exists. Not only that, but it exists in Lebanon, Ohio. Not to be confused with Lebanon, the country that all the students I work with pronounces Lebanon because they've never heard of it. But Kitchenette is an Etsy shop run by somebody out of Lebanon, Ohio. There is also a Kitchenette registered on Instagram and YouTube. I'm not sure if it's the same person. But Kitchenette is out there with 966 Google results using that exact phrase. Not to be confused with your ideas for clothing stores. Spawn of Satin has 818,000 Google search results. But I think it's because people don't know how to spell Satan, judging by what some of those search results were. (laughs) And your other idea for a clothing store, Skagway and Lacey, yields no results. Of the three businesses, Kitchenette, Spawn of Satin, and Skagway and Lacey, the last one would be the one to move forward with. I also believe Skagway and Lacey would be the least likely for people to actually understand why it might be amusing. (laughs) Maybe, but at least Dad would get it. There also happens to be a German singer named Annette Louisanne who has an album called Kitsch. So in a way, it's Kitchenette as well. Now that we've finished our cleansing and our edification, it's time to get back to the text exchange which started the show. What do you want to tell me about the Ukrainian National Anthem? I don't believe I'll start with the Ukrainian National Anthem as much as I'm going to assume that for both of us, our interest in anthems has to do with Father Art's passion for anthems. It's quite possible he does like a good song. And he does like a good anthem. He'll watch the beginning of sporting events just to see the anthems and then turn them off. 
I wonder if any of those move them to tears because college fight songs can do that. It's a fair question. Probably when they're sung with enough passion or at the right moment in time, it probably would. Very true. The Ukrainian national anthem. Some interesting words. I don't know that I would have expected most national anthems to have such evocative phrasing as evaporating your enemies as dew evaporates in the sunshine. That's a fairly evocative line and not really what I would have generally expected in national anthems. Yeah, there are so many ways to eliminate an enemy, but evaporation is aggressive and probably worth singing about. If you're evaporating your enemies, does that make Ukrainian national anthem a murder ballad? It does make it a murder ballad, and it also means that Ukrainians in this song would be the sunshine, right? Yes, they would be the sunshine. Cool. So the sunshine is a murderer. In the murder ballad sense, the sunshine is a murderer. And also in a practical sense as well, over time, it does get to people. Hmm. As we like to do on this show, I want to do a quick quiz. I'm, I'm guessing you researched some of the same things and saw some of the same articles I did. So I want to see how much you can remember from your research on national anthems. Yes, brother. Longest national anthem. Uh, longest national anthem, counting the verses that are actually sung or hidden verses that are not performed. All verses. But if you want to answer it the other way, you can as well. I don't know either answer, so I'm going to go with a country with a long name. Let's say Turkmenistan. No, Greece. Uh. 158 stanzas. Jeez. It's an <laughs> epic poem of its own. It was based on an epic poem, in fact. Yes. That's right. Uh, shortest national anthem. <sighs> um, which country would not have much to say? That's not very nice. I don't know. There are two ways to answer that. Shortest in terms of the length of time it takes to sing, the amount of music, is Uganda. Oh, okay. With eight bars of music. Nice. And there are four beats per bar, generally speaking. So they end up usually singing multiple verses, mm. actually, because their verse is so short. Or you could answer it with Japan, which has the oldest continuously used anthem as well, but it's only 32 characters long, but is 11 bars. Hmm. I once beatboxed behind that anthem while a student sang it, and it was brilliant. Kimi ga yo ah. That's all I know. It's an interesting set of words because it talks about Japan lasting for 10,000 years mm. until the pebbles grow into boulders and become covered in moss. Oh, is that how science works? I said to myself, is that how it works? Apparently, yes. Very cool. I looked into this and there's this thing, Sazari Ishi, that are tiny pebbles that calcify and turn into a larger rock. Love it. So they become boulders. Love it. It's actually a thing. Good on you, Japan. I know, right? Yep. National anthem with no lyrics. Spain? You got it. Yeah. National anthem written in the first person. Turkmenistan. Andorra. Oh, I was close. They sing about how they are the true descendants of Charlemagne and Charlemagne created them. Very good. So I'll end the quiz there. I think that's a I think that's enough. Did you have any quizzes about violent national anthems? I didn't have any quizzes, but I did look into scary anthem lines. Ooh, which ones did you like? I liked Algeria, yes, Vietnam, and France. Yes, they're all on my list. I love the Algeria one. It's, it's so poetic. We swear by the lightning that destroys, by the streams of generous blood being shed. Wow. So we have taken the noise of gunpowder as our rhythm and the sound of machine guns as our melody. <laughs> That is definitely a murder ballad. Algeria's murder ballad gets a hearty stamp of approval. According to an article that I read by Adam Todd Brown, it was an anthem written by a guy named Mufti Zechariah in the mid-1900s, and it was all about fighting back against the French colonial forces. So it had good reason to be angry, and it pulled that off effectively. Well done, Algeria. I mean, that's what an anthem should be about, like powerful and emphatic and leaving nothing to chance. Absolutely couple of other ones, quick hits, before we get into ones that we might discuss a little bit more at length. The Italian anthem talks about the blood of Italy burning Austrian eagle hearts. And Hungary's talks about burning the tears of orphans. I'm not exactly sure of the context, but I also don't care. That's phenomenal. I mean, you might as well, if you're going to burn tears, burn the tears of orphans. Well, Vietnam's talked about the path to glory is built by the bodies of our foes. Vietnam also swallowed its hatred and is ready to make all sacrifices. Like, you know you're in trouble there. It does sound scary. And then the Marseillaise, Wink. singing about the impure blood watering our furrows, you're literally eating the blood of your foes then. It grows into your food. 
Yeah, let's march, let's march, that their impure blood should water our fields or furrows. That's brilliant. But is that actually good fertilizer? Or would that kill your crop? Electrolytes, it's what plants need. Electrolyte, song by R.E.M. on the album New Adventures of Hi-Fi. What is your what is your favorite national anthem? I was thinking about that today, but I don't really have a good answer. I do know that the Russian national anthem just has music that gets me pumped up, but it's kind of like I also enjoy Hail to the Victors, the Michigan fight song. It's our sworn enemy, but they got a good song, and it just sounds epic when the Russian national anthem is started, but I don't have any clue what the words mean. My favorite is the South African national anthem. I feel like it's a proper national anthem. It's sung in five different languages. Whoa. And it's actually two different songs smashed together with two different composers. It's awesome. Nikosti Sikaleli Africa. Awesome. Malu Fakensiwa Upando Iwayo. So it goes in Zosa for the first two lines, then Zulu for the second two lines. Hmm. Then it's the second verse is in Sesotho. The third verse is in Afrikaans, which is still somewhat controversial because they picked it up basically from the previous national anthem when it was under apartheid. So not awesome. Mm -hmm. And then the fourth verse is actually in English. It's a great song. Are there any other national anthems that you love or find violent or anything? That's that's my favorite anthem of itself. There's some other interesting stories behind national anthems, but that, that's my favorite. My two favorite national anthem moments, though, I was thinking about this. What are my two favorite national anthem moments? My first one. Roseanne Barr singing the Star Spangled Banner. No, I, I think that's Roseanne Barr is always low on my list of oh, okay. things that I might like. But uh, my first favorite national anthem moment, I don't know if you remember this, but there used to be a referee when I played basketball. And dad knows his name, but I don't remember his name. But there's this referee. He was short, had really curly hair, short curly hair. And everybody called him Chia Ref after Chia Pets, but they called him Chia Ref. But not in a mean way. We all love Chia sure. Ref. Yeah, definitely not in a mean way. Right? And we and they used to chant, we love Chia Ref all the time. I love that guy. But he used to sing the national anthem occasionally before our games. Ooh. And he was singing the national anthem. We were sitting in the gym in Woodville, and he's singing the song. And uh, as he's finishing it up, everybody starts chanting, we love Chia Ref. And I don't know why I love that, but I just love that moment. <laughs> and I always will remember that. And my second favorite national anthem moment is when you and I ran our first marathon together and we were singing the Canadian national anthem for no apparent reason. And that was excellent. Yeah, I love the Canadian national anthem. Maybe that's my favorite. I do also like the Canadian national anthem. That's the only one other than the Star Spangled Banner for which I know all the words. So that helps. So I might have to still rate the Russian anthem before it because I like the sound. But O Canada is strong. Do you know both the English and the French version of O Canada? No, nope. I know a lot of the French version of the French song, La Marseillaise, but I don't know the French version of O Canada. Which anthem are you singing? I don't know. That's La Marseillaise. I do know. I just thought you might be singing that, um, saying that you're going to lead those Canadian citizens into battle. Well, I've done a lot of talking here, so where do you want to take it? Well, going back to the original text, I was fascinated that the Ukrainians were threatening to evaporate their enemies. Indeed. And it got me thinking about songs that made threats, which immediately brought to mind Guns N' Roses, Welcome to the Jungle, You're Gonna Die! It's very threatening. Is that a murder ballad? Dun, dun, dun. I don't know if it's a murder ballad to just talk about murdering somebody when they get to the jungle. Murder adjacent, then. Yes. We had a category called murder adjacent. There you go, everybody. Guns and Roses, Welcome to the Jungle, murder adjacent. But I really didn't pursue that angle. What I decided to pursue instead was the Ukrainian national anthem talks about evaporating its enemies. It doesn't use the word directly, but it's clearly threatening to evaporate enemies, which is awesome. But it got me wondering, are there songs about evaporation? And I went onto the internet and I did a lot of searching about songs that feature evaporation. Are they actually songs about the water cycle or just in general about evaporation? Interesting question. Interesting that you asked that. One of the songs by Sparkle and the Shine Kids happens to be called The Water Cycle. We have lots of water cycle songs in some of the programs I have worked on in the past. Beautiful. This one says something like evaporation leads to condensation. Evaporation leads to condensation. That's how the water cycle goes. Out comes the sun. It's getting hot. Water turns to steam. It's going up. It makes a cloud, a big white cloud. 
up in the sky, way up high. The air gets cold, it's cold up there. The water drops form, they're getting big. Fall to the ground, down they go. To the ocean again, yeah! Yeah! I have no idea what the actual tune is. I just made up the tune. I listened to it earlier, but I- Aw, you made up the tune? But I do like that it ends in yeah, because there's the song Little Einsteins. Do you know that song? Oh yeah. I'm going on a trip. And my favorite favorite rocket rocket ship. ship. So that song ends with all of the children who are singing the song. I don't recall what the last line is, but as soon as it finishes, they go, yeah! And I had this theory that I developed years ago that any song, when capped by the word, yeah, would be a great song. So think of some song that you know the final line of. Do it right now. Before I do that, I'm going to say that I did read a thing about Steven Tyler adding a yeah to the national anthem. Not well received at a, I believe it was a Yankees Red Sox game. The nerve. Right, think of a song I know. I'm a little teapot. What is the end of that song? I'm a little teapot, short and stout. Here's my hand, oh, here's my thumb. <laughs> when I get all steamed up and I shout, tip me over and pour me out. Yeah! See, it works. That's perfect. Yeah, that song's probably easier because it's a kid song. But what if we try it with an adult song or a song that deals with serious themes? The obvious one to pick out here would be something like Rammstein or maybe the Crash Test Dummies mm mmm song. He couldn't quite explain it. They'd always just gone there. Yeah! That doesn't work as well. How about uh, Roy Orbison uh, singing Love Hurts? Or Nazareth, if you prefer that version. Okay. Love Hurts. Ooh, Love Hurts. Yeah! Yeah! See, no, it doesn't work for me. Okay, but it does work when you're singing a children's song to teach them about evaporation. That's one song that I found on the theme of evaporation. I actually found, according to lyrics.com, the website, that there were 88 songs using the word evaporation directly. And that includes a lot of English songs. The French songs that used it came up as well. So in English or French or any language which the word evaporation looks the same, 88 different mentions. We already talked about the Sparkle and Shine kids singing the water cycle. But did you know that the song Face It by Juddy Jutt also mentions evaporation? I didn't. Shoddy, why you hit my line when I'm wasted? I've been taking L's, but you know I'm a face it. I've been going out, but mama said she hates it. I got my drip up in the air, evaporation. I would would never have gotten that. He's right, though. Like, drips in the air will, will evaporate. So maybe we should use that to teach science. Bob Dylan had a song that he gave to Joan Baez. That one mentioned evaporation as well. That song was called Love is Just a Four-Letter Word. Joan Baez sings, Searching for my double, looking for complete evaporation to the core. Though I tried and failed at finding any door, I must leave, thought that there was nothing more absurd than love is just a four-letter word. But my favorite one is a song by a Scottish fellow. I actually saw him singing it. He's a wee country singer-songwriter, he describes himself. And he wrote the song, Last Thoughts of a Snowman. What's that on my chest? Don't think it's condensation. My damnation. Evaporation. Where did I come from? I don't know. Where am I going? I don't know. You just rolled me up one day. Now the sun is taking me away. Where do you go when you're made of snow? The sun's overhead, and it's claimed my snowy bed. Water's dripping down my head, and soon I will be dead. But my soul will be free, even when there's no more me. Was that written by Olaf the Snowman? Nope. It was written by Andrew Huggin, the Scottish person. All right. Yeah. But yeah, the the subject of violent songs and national anthems certainly does have some major crossover with the whole murder ballad thing. It makes sense. These songs were often written uh, during times of crisis and revolution. So I suppose it makes sense that people were angry and out for blood. Indeed it does. Going back to the Ukrainian National Anthem, there was one more thing that I wanted to talk about. I wanted to talk about its opening line, which was originally from a poem written in the 1860s. The music followed it about a year later. The original poem said that Ukraine has not yet died, nor has her glory or freedom, which it's kind of implying, yeah, we're kind of hanging on. We'll probably die at some point, but we haven't yet. So they had to change the lyrics when they brought it back in the past few decades to say that Ukraine's glory and freedom have not perished. But I prefer the original part, which says, our country hasn't died yet, but eh, 
Let's be realistic here. There's something to be said for trying to be realistic. I mean, when you got a neighbor as angry and brutish as the Russian Federation there, I suppose you always are wondering if tomorrow's the day where they come back for what they believe is their own. Good point, brother. I spent some time looking just at the stories behind anthems. Interesting. And a lot of them are the same. And I know I've mentioned this a couple times already. Revolutions, people in prison writing stuff for when they get out, or times of revolution, just some songs that people were excited about. And most of us know that the U.S. anthem was based on a, an English song, but I hadn't really ever looked up what that song was or what it was about. They called it a body pub song. I have to say that I read the lyrics for the first time ever. And to be honest, if it's body, it's either too archaic for me to understand or I'm just too naive and innocent because I didn't catch what was body about it. Totally went over my head, I suppose. But the first song that actually used the same tune to be related to American politics was Adams and Liberty, which was probably the first official campaign song in U.S. politics uh, celebrating Adams. So they used the same tune as the basis of this campaign song because it was a well-known tune. Hmm. I did feel bad for the guy that is credited with composing the Bosnian national anthem. Why is that? Dusan Sestik. He's a Serbian who joined a competition to compose a national anthem for Bosnia because he couldn't pay his hotel bill. (laughs) And he thought he would write a song that was just good enough to get him second or third because it was the same amount of money that the first place winner would get. But he ended up winning, which, of course, made all of the Serbs angry at him because he was a traitor. The Bosnians were mad because the Serb wrote the tune, you know, and so he can't get a job. His life is terrible. He also joins the competition to write the words for the tune because it didn't have words to begin with. And he also won that. But the Bosnian government refused to use his words once they realized it was him who wrote it. That makes sense. Because he was a Serbian. Yeah. And then, to top it all off, in 2009, he was accused of stealing the tune from the opening music of Animal House. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. That poor guy. And his response to that was, I don't know, when I was younger, maybe I heard it and it just stuck in my head someplace. He didn't say he didn't. He didn't say he did. But that would make it even better. Maybe we should rewrite a lot of the world's national anthems and use, I don't know, Revenge of the Nerds or something as our inspiration. I can't say I I know that song, but I I would probably choose Midnight Madness. It's Midnight Midnight Madness, Madness, the best movie that nobody knows. Yeah, I'd probably use that as the beginning. Hmm. The Dutch national anthem, Wilhelmus, is actually an acrostic. So if you take the first letter of each stanza when it was written, it comprised the name Willem van Nassau, which was Dutch for William of Nassau. So they wrote, wrote a national anthem intentionally to make an acrostic in celebration of William of Orange. You're acrostic. I don't know what to say to that. One of my favorite stories about how a national anthem was written, though, was the Mexican national anthem, which I I do generally know because I lived there for a while Mm -hmm. and I do like their national anthem. It's it's quite a good composition. But I had no idea that their national anthem was written in about four hours by poet Francisco González Bocanegra. They ran a contest to to have the national anthem written. Mm. Francisco González Bocanegra's fiance was like, dude, you're a poet. Go write a national anthem. And he's like, no, I don't want to, because writing love poems is not really similar to writing a national anthem. And she was like, no, I really want you to do this. I think you can win and you're going to do this. And he said, no, I'm not going to do it. So she lures him into a bedroom, locks him into the bedroom with a bunch of patriotic posters and things about the history of Mexico Mm. and says, I'll let you out when you've written a worthwhile national anthem. So after a while of whining about it, he just writes a national anthem. He slides the paper under the door. He wrote 10 verses in the four hours. And the song was entered into the contest in 1853. And in 1854, it was selected and announced by President Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana. Oh. That, in fact, that was the national anthem. So that's how the Mexican national anthem was written by a guy who was imprisoned by his fiance and forced to write the lyrics to the song. Usually when people were confined to write the songs, it was because they were revolutionaries and about to be tortured and killed. But no, he was just being tortured by his soon-to-be wife. Hmm. Did you happen to know that Santa Ana's wooden leg was captured in battle in 1847, is still on display at the Illinois State Military Museum. It's never been repatriated. That's one of two legs that I know has been displayed in a museum. 
Texas has put together petitions several times because they believe since it was captured in Texas, they have the right to his leg. I feel like if you're going to move it, you should move it back to Mexico. I didn't know any of that. Santa Ana's actual leg was buried with military honors while he was still alive. So he got to go to his own funeral, sort of. Did you know that I once knew a man with a wooden leg named Smith? (laughs) What was the name of his other leg? A wooden leg named Smith. Oh, a wooden, a wooden leg. (laughs) Then I also spent some time looking for horrible mistakes where they played the wrong national anthem at an event or a time. I was really excited. I thought, I'm going to find some really funny stuff here. And there's not a lot funny there. It's just a lot of dumb things where someone played the wrong song. It probably wasn't intentional. They apologized for it. It created a little bit of an incident. But, you know, everybody got over it. Sure. The one that kept coming up, though, was Kazakhstan. Yeah. Partially because of Borat Uh, and his uh, parody of the Kazakhstan national anthem. So at a shooting event in Kuwait, somebody had downloaded, by mistake, someone had downloaded Borat's version (laughs) and they played it to celebrate a person who won. They got angry at him and then they they restaged a medal ceremony so the person could get get the right song played. But they played the entire song. Very nice. Yeah. And then poor Kazakhstan, another time they started playing the national anthem. I don't remember what event it was played for, but they started to play the national anthem and it was actually Living La Vida Loca (laughs) by Ricky Martin. And I don't know how you make that mistake, but after they played the first few, the first bar or so, they quickly stopped and started playing the correct song. Yeah, it's the one. I just wonder if that was done at a football match and all the players were lined up, if they would just go with it and start singing the song or if they would riot or show their displeasure in some visible way. I think that's all I want to say about national anthems, other than the fact that I love the South African national anthem. There's something powerful about the Canadian national anthem for me. I don't know. I agree with you there. There's not a lot of mix-ups that are fun. That's about it. All I know is that when we start our island nation we're going to evaporate our enemies throughout the entire song. I don't want to evaporate them because I want to walk on their bodies as my path. You are not going to be a cabinet member with that attitude. I don't want to be a member of your cabinet. One man who would never turn down a cabinet appointment is our Father Art, and we're going to ask him some questions. What is your favorite national anthem or patriotic song? My favorite national anthem is that of Wales. I I love to hear the Welsh sing it. I don't know the words. I don't know Welsh. But uh, that and the Italian national anthem, which is always sung with gusto, are my favorite. I would enjoy the Spanish national anthem more if it had words. Do you have a favorite Ukrainian? Um, No. But I'm sure whoever it is, they play tennis. If you were put in charge of writing a national anthem for a new country, not your native nation, and wanted to include a lightly veiled threat to an unspecified enemy, what lyric would you include? Um, I, I don't know, but it would probably be something uh, out of a uh, Maori haka. Do you find it appropriate for a nation's anthem to subtly suggest that it will make its enemies evaporate? That's good. I, I like uh, any, nation, any national anthem or, or a college fight song that uh, takes a jab at their opponent. I think that's, that's always a good thing. Well, folks, now that we've heard from Father Art, it means that our time together is coming to an end for this episode. We've said just about everything we're prepared to say about Vietnam, Chia Rep, Body Pub Song, the Ukraine, Living La Vida Loca, Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana, and Sanguine Irrigation. But fear not, just as soon as we can dig back into the archives and find another gem of a text exchange, there'll be another episode coming your way. In the meantime, you can head over to our Instagram page at Things I Text My Brother Podcast to drop us a note about what you liked or what you didn't like, or to tell us something that we got totally wrong. You might even have enough time to go tell a friend, an enemy, and a total stranger to give us a listen as well. If you manage to do any of that, the fraternity of Drew Yards will be forever grateful. 
But most importantly, thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you next time. We need to find the Urban Dictionary result for drip. I don't. I don't want to do that. Oh, I want to know what I said. Uh, drip. I don't want to be a part of that. Drip. Adjective to describe your outfit similar to swag. So this person in the song said, I got my drip up. I got my drip up in the air. Evaporation. I got my outfit in the air. Evaporation. Why is his outfit floating? No idea. Confusing. All right. I won't mention that in the closing then. Okay. Uh, I'm going to make this recording stop. Put us out of our misery. Yeah! yeah!